Um, I am glad to welcome uh, all the participants at uh, the webinar applying benchmarking for better performance of open universities. This is uh, the first webinar in the series of UNESCO IIT webinars, Harnessing Technologies to Transform Education. I am pleased that, uh, well, uh, we expect uh, to, to inform you that we expect participants from uh, uh, 19 countries who are registered for the webinar and uh, except for uh, Russia and China, of course, because uh, Shanghai Open University is uh, the organizer of this webinar. Uh, we also have participants from um, South Africa, Vietnam, Zimbabwe, Gambia, Philippines, Pakistan, Botswana, Indonesia, Nepal, Lebanon, Nigeria, Malaysia, Mauritius, UK, Ghana, Turkmenistan, and India. So, um, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Tao Jan, director of UNESCO IAT, to deliver uh, opening remarks for the participants. Please, Dr. Jan. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Svetlana. Uh, dear Professor Lo Jinjiang, uh, dear colleagues and dear participants, uh, welcome you all, thank you all, and welcome you all to today's webinar, organized jointly by UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies in Education, IITE, and our collaboration partner, Shanghai Open University uh, in China. Um, this is, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, this is the very first one uh, the first webinar of IITE's webinar series in 2023, entitled Harnessing Technology to Transform Education. Uh, this webinar series comes, to, uh, comes from uh, a uh, proposal uh, from uh, Professor Asha Kanwar, uh, the uh, chair of IITE governing board, uh, Professor Asha is also the president and CEO of Commerce of Learning. And this webinar series is supported uh, by all uh, IIT uh, government board members. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, uh, Dr. Sanjaya, uh, representing uh, Professor Asha and Commerce of Learning, will be also delivering a short speech uh, in this uh, webinar. So the idea of the webinar series uh, is to bring together uh, our partners from different regions and different sectors uh, of the world and work together on a number of challenging issues and uh, uh, major concerns uh, in uh, the digital transformation uh, of education. We are going to share uh, and to exchange new ideas and new outcomes of research projects and new uh, practices in the digital uh, transformation uh, of education. And to uh, engage uh, policymakers, uh, educators and teachers that uh, what was uh, happening today for discussion and debate. So the keywords for today's webinar uh, are benchmarking and uh, open universities. And this is part of the uh, joint projects uh, between uh, jointly uh, by UNESCO IITE and the Shanghai Open University. And uh, Shanghai Open University is a close collaboration partner with IITE, uh, they host and coordinate a unit twin for open universities. And what we're going to share uh, with the participants uh, is uh, partially uh, outcomes, partial outcomes of this uh, joint project, uh, working together uh, by my team, uh, led by uh, Mrs. Svetlana and uh, Ms. Natalia on the other part and I, uh, SOE, uh, Shanghai Open uh, professional team, 
as one united team. So we are very uh, proud of our collaboration and uh, the outcomes of this project. And my special uh, thanks and uh, appreciation uh, also go uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Neil Busha, who contributes uh, to this project, uh, who is going to deliver the keynote uh, presentation today. So uh, let me finish by saying uh, that uh, we welcome you and thank you all for your participating and uh, engagement. We are also looking forward to have you with us, not only for this webinar, uh, as I said, this is the first one, we are going to have at least nine uh, webinars uh, on different topics. Uh, we're looking forward to have you with us and meeting with you in for this webinar and the other webinars in the future, uh, all will be organized this year jointly by IITE and our partners. And finally, I wish um, a very productive and inspiring discussion uh, in this webinar, uh, the first one of our series, uh, webinar series today. Now I give the screen back to uh, my colleague, uh, Mrs. Svetlana. Thank you, Professor Zhang. And uh, now it's my pleasure to uh, pass the floor uh, to Mr. Jun Jiang Lu, Executive Vice Chair of uh, the Council of Shanghai Open University Council. So um, the floor is yours, Mr. Lu. Thank you. Zhang 它成立于1960年,原名是上海电视大学。需求的学习者助力他们实现终生学习的梦想与展所长领导的联合国教科文组织信息教育信息技术研究所开展合作推动信息技术在开放远程教育当中的应用合作项目之一全球开放大学优质发展基准指南研制目的在通过开展开放大学以及相关开放远程教育机构的国际调查研究编制全球开放大学优质发展基准指南推动全球开放大学在终生学习时代下的转型和发展发挥着关键作用以及技术变革的快速发展
，以更好的适应全民终身学习需求的增长，提供更多优质、包容、灵活的终身学习机会。非常感谢各所院校参与到这一个项目当中，也感谢各位与会代表为基础指南建言献策。上海开放大学衷心希望。在这个合作过程当中，能够汇聚各个国各国开放远程教育专家的杰出智慧，我们也非常乐意分享中国的经验和做法，与大家共同规划开放大学未来的发展蓝图，为推动开放教育可持续发展做出贡献。谢谢大家。Thank you, Mr. Lu. And uh, well, the next speaker will be uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay Mishra, Director of Education at the Commonwealth of Learning. Due to the time difference, uh, he uh, could not join us real time, but he kindly recorded a video to greet the participants. I would like to ask my colleagues to uh, turn on a video. Hello, and greetings to everyone present for this consultative meeting on applying benchmarking for better performance of open universities, organized by the UNESCO Institute for Information Technology in Education and Shanghai Open University. At the outset, I would like to thank Mr. Tao Zhan, Director IIT, for inviting the Commonwealth of Learning, and Professor Asa Kanwar, President and CEO of CALL, to nominate me to share our thoughts on this topic in this consultation meeting. Congratulations on identifying such an important topic. At a time when the importance of open universities and distance education has increased, and there is a strong need for equitable access to education and training for all, this project is timely and relevant. A recent survey of open universities in the Commonwealth revealed that over 3.4 million learners study with them, 2,745 programs and 24,505 courses in a wide range of disciplines are available, mostly in humanities and social sciences. The open universities offer programs at level three to level eight of the international standard classification of education. They depend primarily on part-time teachers, mainly rely on student fees, and usually have surplus funds due to economies of scale. They use different operations, models, using online and study center-based models to deliver teaching and learning. We also noticed that the institutions are becoming multimodal, offering courses and programs in blended online and face-to-face -face mode in addition to traditional distance education. This new development makes quality assurance and benchmarking of open universities more complex. Quality assurance in distance education is about the perspective of industrialization of education, where the quality of learning materials, the effectiveness of learner support, the turnaround time of assignments, the system's responsiveness to facilitated learning, etc., play a critical role. Most countries follow both internal and external quality assurance approaches. Some countries like India and Malaysia have special regulations and guidelines for distance education programs. The Quality Assurance Agency in UK reviews the quality of the open university using the same criteria used for other universities. Benchmarking is used as a quality assurance approach to meet standards and compares similar institutions' performance. Such an approach helps institutions to innovate and maintain quality. Call has developed a benchmarking toolkit for technology enabled learning, implemented in several higher education institutions to understand their status and preparedness for integrating and leveraging technology enabled learning. This toolkit is not specific to distance education or open university. 
but is used by higher education institutions. The benchmarking is from an institutional perspective and does not focus on the pedagogical level where a different set of quality assurance mechanisms are proposed, such as using checklists and rubrics. One such tool is rubrics for quality assurance of blended learning. Call also has a toolkit for reviewing and improving distance education operations in dual mode universities, which may be more aligned with the functions of open universities. Several other benchmarking tools are available for teaching and learning, including the Australasian Council on Open Distance and e-learning benchmarks for technology enhanced learning. Recently, a study by the European University Association identified 10 different frameworks of assessment of digital learning in higher education. Developing benchmarks for open university is a challenging task as their models of operations vary greatly. The benchmarking toolkit for open universities could serve as a guidance tool to provide indicators that respective institutions in their local context could adopt. I once again congratulate the team working on this exciting project to enhance the performance of open universities as change agents in achieving sustainable development goals for. Thank you for your attention. And uh, well, indeed, now we'll start the uh, program uh, of uh, the webinar. And uh, um, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Neil Butcher for presenting the draft document that has been circulated among you, benchmarking for open universities guidelines and good uh, practices. And I hope all of you had a chance to get acquainted with this document. Uh, well, I just would like to mention that we are happy to have been uh, collaborating with Mr. Uh, Neil Butcher, who is a recognized uh, expert in um, uh, diverse fields of uh, ICT and education. And uh, uh, he also uh, well, has long-term experience of uh, uh, collaborating with UNESCO headquarters uh, and different agencies and institutes and the World Bank. Please, uh, Mr. Butcher, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Svetlana, and um, thank you, colleagues. It's great to be part of this uh, process today, and we're very honored to have been given the opportunity to participate in assembling the report that's been shared with you already. I'd just like to publicly acknowledge also the contributions to this report of my colleague, Alison Zimmerman, who is on this report, on this call as well and is based at the moment in Vietnam. I'm currently based in Johannesburg in South Africa, uh, which is also my home country. And um, I've been working in the field of distance education and open learning for the last 30 years. So my career goes back some distance before the development of digital technologies and the integration of digital technologies into open learning and distance education. Uh, and, and so I think that what we've obviously experienced over the last 10 years or so is a radical transformation in terms of the ways in which open learning and distance education can be delivered using technologies. I think in that context of rapid change, the process of benchmarking and following guidelines um, and experiences of other institutions actually becomes increasingly important. One of the biggest risks I see to distance education and open universities in the current context is the tendency to be, be pressurized into following new technological trends um, and losing sight of the core educational principles on top of which all good distance education is based. 
and has always been based regardless of the technologies that are being used. So my experience is very much the case that any distance education practice that is based on poor educational or pedagogical principles will only magnify the, the use of technology in that distance education is only going to magnify those educational uh, underlying educational principles. So if the underlying educational principles and foundations are good and solid, then we can integrate use of technology in ways that will enhance those good educational uh, practices. If on the other hand, the educational or pedagogical principles on which our programs are based are poor quality, the technology is actually uh, going to make it worse. So this is why we were so interested in this particular benchmarking exercise. Um, in presenting a, a few thoughts today, we're not going to go through the full report, which is obviously very detailed, as I will explain. What we're going to do is provide a little bit of an introduction to the report uh, and also give you a flavor of what's there, and then hopefully have some, uh, a lot of time left afterwards to get your feedback and comments on what we've done, because this is a draft document that is still in progress. Uh, and so we're looking forward to feedback from colleagues today uh, as we work towards finalizing the, the report. So obviously, uh, I think we'll all agree, those amongst uh, in today's webinar, that there is a critical role for open universities. And I would argue that that role is getting more important. Obviously, uh, UNESCO's Sustainable Development Goal 4, or SDG 4, which is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all, is at the heart of that. And then a survey of open universities that was done recently in the Commonwealth indicated that there are really three top priorities for open universities, these being high quality learner support, uh, putting in place the necessary e-learning infrastructure and capacity to deliver effective online learning, and then the importance of quality assurance. And as you'll see, the processes of benchmarking are very much tied up in quality assurance. So the opportunity to strengthen open and distance learning or ODL provision lies in quality assuring critical aspects of that delivery, which would include in the modern era, things such as technology and enabled learning, also the management and use of uh, open educational resources, uh, that's resor educational resources that have been released under an open license and that facilitate their reuse. So, so these areas or aspects of open learning and distance education are becoming increasingly important to understand. Benchmarking against good practice domains and criteria is a key aspect of quality assurance for open universities, particularly in delivering lifelong learning. So it's something that we would recommend that all universities should be doing regularly. When we think about the relationship of quality assurance and benchmarking, uh, there's a couple of observations. The report goes into this in much greater detail. First of all, as I think we would all agree, Quality is a function of it's a it's a number it's a combination of different factors that we need to take into account. These include the strategic goals of the institution, which can be very different from one context to the next. The competencies required to execute uh, that that strategic goal, the resources that are available, and the social conditions of implementation. So, what may be important in a country like Australia, for example, would be very different from what's important in a context like South Africa, where I live. And the same would apply in all countries. So quality assurance is based on the intended learning outcomes, looking at student engagement, the availability of resources, teaching quality, support for learning, and the quality of student work. And, and these are all areas that we need to be exploring as part of the ongoing process of quality assurance, which is built into open university systems. Of course, as I've already indicated, every open university has a unique context uh, and a unique context for quality. So there's no one size fits all for benchmarking tools or one approach to quality assurance and the use of benchmarking within quality assurance that would be appropriate for every institution. And that has informed the way in which we've constructed the report that we're sharing with you today. So benchmarking is the practice of comparing an organization's processes, practices and performance metrics to good practices in the industry. Uh, and there's a number of different ways in which we can do this. And I'll take you through some examples of that as we proceed through the presentation. So the purpose of the, the research work that we've done and the report that we've compiled 
has not been to create another new tool for benchmarking good practices in open learning because several benchmarking tools already exist. And these are fit for purpose in different contexts and for specific domains of open, lear open and distance learning practice. So what we tried to do in this document, guide, uh, particularly under the, the guidance of the Shanghai Open University and IITE, was to develop a, a set of guidelines and good practices that were intended first to summarize the common tools that are available. Uh, and, and we tried to focus on those tools that are openly available online, that are used for benchmarking, mapping them against domains of good practice, and then providing some recommendations about how open universities might consider drawing on different elements of those, uh, those benchmarking tools to support their own practices of benchmarking. What was also done uh, by our colleagues from the Open University and, and IITE uh, was an extensive process of documenting case studies of many open universities around the world. So you will see short summaries of uh, those case studies contained in the final report, but there are actually even longer case studies which we will publish online and link to when this process is finished where a number of different open universities have documented their approach to these kinds of issues. What we've done in the report is distilled from those case studies examples of good practice uh, from a range of open universities. And again, trying to highlight the variety and diversity of approaches that can be used when trying to build quality. And again, the objective of this is not to try to give you a kind of blueprint or a formula for what you should do in your institution, but rather to supply a menu of options uh, that you would compare against your own context and your own needs and your own existing practices and be able to draw on as you deem appropriate. We also hope, of course, that because this is building a network of open universities in communication with one another, that where you identify specific good practices that you think are relevant to your own institution, you might reach out directly to some of your peer universities and learn in more detail from what they're doing. Uh, so we do hope that that kind of peer-to-peer -peer networking might be uh, one of the products of this particular process. So distilling from all of those benchmarking tools that, that we've analyzed in this report, as well as the good practices that we found in the case studies, we've identified a number of domains of good practice for open universities. Uh, I'm not going to read these all out uh, because that would be very tedious. But of course, as with any exercise of this kind, one could slightly vary the terminology. One could have some slightly different domains of good practice. What we've tried to do is to un underline uh, or outline under each of these what's covered in these domain areas um, so that you can then see how these domains of practice would be the areas in which you benchmark your own practices against what's happening globally. Uh, and so you'll see there's lots of things like, for example, curriculum design, student and learner support, technology and ICT systems and infrastructure, and so on. Uh, and, and again, where within an open university, one might be seeking to identify a particular area where you feel that strengthening is needed and just zone in on that. Alternatively, one might be going through a regular process, say every three to five years, where you engage in an institution-wide benchmarking practice or process, and using these domains of practice could help you to organize those processes. So again, this is a lens through which you can look at your own practices uh, and decide where you want to focus your own energy and attention in benchmarking your performance against that of your peers around the world. Turning to the benchmarking tools that we analyzed for this report, and I will take you very briefly through uh, a summary of those tools shortly, but it's just worth possibly pointing out that all of the benchmarking tools had a few common features, uh, which should ideally always form part of a good benchmarking process. So the first is that they, they generally always have good practice statements, uh, summarizing what good practice looks like. They then have some clear performance indicators in most cases. These are discrete statements that help to unpack the good practice statement so that we can understand better what kinds of performance we're aspiring towards in order to achieve good practice in this area, as well as performance measures 
which enable us to assess the progress that we are making towards the attainment or achievement of that performance indicator. And then lastly, they include evidence that would support that assessment process. In other words, we want to measure the progress that we're making towards the performance indicator. Where will we look for evidence in order to be able to assess the progress that we're making and, and uh, how, how, how close we are in progressing towards the good practices that have been identified. So these are fairly common features of all benchmarking tools. But then from there, the benchmarking tools that we've analyzed are, are quite diverse and varied in their approaches. So I can't go into the detail of that given the time constraints, but just to give you a flavor of that, I'm gonna take you through each of the tools that we identified. Uh, my colleague Sanjaya from Commonwealth of Learning already identified uh, by name several of these benchmarking tools. So, so what I'm talking about here uh, is referring to several of the tools that he had already mentioned. So the first, uh, I, I won't go through all of the detail here, uh, but the first benchmarking tool, tool we looked at is from the Australasian Council on Open Distance and E-Learning. Uh, and this particular benchmarking tool has a very specific focus on technology enhanced learning. Uh, it contains eight discrete, discrete benchmarks, which cover a full spectrum of practice, all the way from governance to support for staff and, learner, uh, for staff and learners. Um, and, and then the benchmarks are structured in such a way that an institution using them can get guidance on the type of evidence that would support their assessment against the performance indicators for each benchmark. So this is a, a very high quality resource um, and, and very well tested and used. I think this is a key observation that I would make throughout. There's, as I mentioned, always a risk when we're doing benchmarking that we focus on innovations that are very recent. Uh, in, a, in an effort to kind of keep up technologically and be, to be demonstrating that we are uh, up to date with the latest technological trends. Uh, in my experience, at the moment, there's a lot of conversation about artificial intelligence or AI and machine learning. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about how AI and machine learning are going to transform educational practices. Uh, I think that that is true in many respects. Um, I think the ways in which it will transform education will be surprising to us. Um, but I, what I think is also clear is that this is a very new technological trend and it's actually not been operating for long enough within institutions for us to have any clear benchmarks of good practice. So in my experience, having been in the field for 30 years, uh, anyone who's telling you that they have a benchmark of good practice for an innovation as recent as AI or machine learning is probably trying to sell you something um, or persuade you uh, that something that they are doing is good. Um, whereas the kinds of benchmarking tools that we're presenting here are distilled from many years of good practice and experience and evidence uh, that these approaches work. And I think that really is critical at this moment in educational history. So the second instrument uh, or benchmarking tool is the European Association, is from the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. Um, and this focuses on evaluating a program. So it has a, it's not an institution-wide uh, approach. It's focusing specifically on programs uh, that lead to qualifications. So it has a very much more niche focus than the previous instrument. It identifies six domain of domains of practice. And very usefully, it has a quick scan questionnaire that you can complete online to help to give you a notional sense as to, first of all, whether the tool is something you'd like to use, and also how you're performing uh, in relation to the benchmarks that are identified. I'm going to go through the next couple of slides a bit quicker because this information is all contained in the, the, uh, the actual report itself. Um, and, and there's a lot of this, a lot of information here. So the next resource is also from the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. And, and this is a quality label checklist specifically for benchmarking MOOCs, massive, massively open online courses. So as you can see, what, they, what that institution now has is a separate benchmarking tool designed for a different purpose, uh, for a very specific purpose again. And of course, if one is implementing online programs that are closed and for registered students only, as well as MOOCs, you could use each of these two tools for the different purposes. Uh, but for those of your institutions that are not involved in MOOC delivery, of course, this one would not be relevant. The fourth tool that we looked at, uh, which Sanjaya mentioned, is the Commonwealth of Learning's Benchmarking Toolkit for Technology-Enabled Learning. 
This focuses on how to implement technology-enabled learning effectively, ensuring good practice and performance improvement. So it has quite a lot of overlap with the Australi Australasian Council's tool that I mentioned, the first instrument. And this one has 10 benchmarking domains. This reminds us that defining domains of, of good practice is what I like to call a cake cutting exercise. So when we cut up a cake, uh, we can always cut it up into different portions, um, but ultimately what matters is whether or not the domains that we've identified cover the full practice, rather than us getting into semantic quibbles about whether it's eight domains or 10 domains, or whether the name that we're using for one domain is the, the best name. What we really wanna look at when we're assessing these benchmarking tools is are they covering all the broad areas under which we want to do benchmarking. So each of these benchmarks, again, as you can see, these common areas uh, has four to six performance indicators. You can use self-review ratings and, and narrative descriptions to do the process of scoring. And then combined scores can be used to make initial recommendations for improvement. All of these resources, as you can see, are intended for ease of use, um, and, and but, but they're very much support resources. So obviously, this will make initial recommendations for improvement. It will be then up to the processes within your open university to take those initial recommendations, which will be quite generic in nature, and then to integrate them in a more substantive way into your quality assurance processes and practices to reflect on what you've learned from the benchmarking and decide what actions you want to take uh, in, in order to try to improve the quality of delivery of uh, open and distance learning in your institution based on what you learn from this. In and of themselves, these recommendations are unlikely to give you that depth of information that you need to be able to uh, implement successfully. The next example comes from the National Association of Distance Education and Open Learning in South Africa, my home country, uh, and there's a set of quality criteria these quality criteria actually predate uh, e-learning's existence. So I was actually personally involved in developing these many years ago uh, when I was an employee at the South African Institute for Distance Education. And um, they've obviously evolved over the years. I think some of where the, the value of these lie is that because the original version of these criteria predates online learning, it's interesting to assess the extent to which these kind of the 13 quality criteria for open and distance learning that are defined there uh, include a lot of coverage of print-based distance education, which is still a very important aspect of distance education delivery in many parts of the world, especially in the developing world. Um, but we can also then look at the extent to which there's crossover in terms of quality considerations between that print-based uh, distance education and online learning. Of course, this instrument has been updated over the years so it also provides full coverage of open learning as well. The next instrument is the Commonwealth of Learning and uh, Distance Education Modernization Project of Sri Lanka's Quality Assurance Toolkit for Distance Higher Education Institutions and Programs. Um, this covers both institutional and program assessment. Uh, and again, goes through many different, many of the same areas that I've spoken about previously. You can look at the detail in the report and assess whether this might be more useful to you than some of the previous tools I've mentioned. The African Council for Distance Education, the ACDE, actually added another criterion to this tool uh, on collaboration. So that was an interesting modification of the original tool there. And then next, uh, and, and fortunately the, the last overview of, of tools, the e-learning maturity model um, is another instrument that can be used. This helps you to assess the extent to which an institution's capa capability to develop, deploy, and support e-learning sustainably is maturing. Um, and and uh, it, it has a number of different levels of, of attainment. Again, many of the features being the same, but this has a, a very strong institutional focus. And then lastly, there is a benchmarking framework for online open smart and technology enhanced higher education. This is the only tool that we assessed that is not openly available on the internet. So one has to be a member of the consortium that developed this tool. Uh, so, so the idea of this is to make sure that the tool is then developed through collaboration and sharing of good practice and it's kept, the, 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 the community is kept, kept closed deliberately for that purpose. 
Unfortunately, um, they did grant us access to the tool so that we could review it. Uh, and we would strongly recommend that you uh, take a look at this. One of the big challenges often I've found in the work that I do is that many institutions rely exclusively on those things that are openly available on the internet. Uh, I'm a great uh, advocate of open licensing and OERs or open educational resources. But on the other hand, I recognize that there is significant value in many of the tools and resources that are not available openly. And so we shouldn't become closed minded and only focus on those things that are uh, easily accessible. We should take the time to investigate some of those um, resources and tools and processes that are only available, for example, in this case, if you become a member of the consortium, because there is often value to be gained from that. And in my opinion, we should never be scared to be spending money on these kinds of processes, particularly if it gets us access to a lot of um, IP or intellectual property that can help us to accelerate our learning process. We expect our students to pay for many of our courses and programs. Likewise, I think we should expect to pay to learn how to improve the quality of our practices in some instances. So I apologize that this is very small text, but I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot from the report itself. Uh, so in section three of the report, what we having then unpacked uh, each of these benchmarking tools and described how they work so that you can understand better which of them might be useful to you in your institutional context, but without requiring you to do all the work that we've already done of, of reviewing each of them in detail. What we've then done is tried to summarize within the domains of good practice, the different aspects of good practice that are under each of those domains, and then to refer you to which of the tools that we have identified could be most useful to you if you were interested in benchmarking your uh, good practice in that area against global good practice. So again, I, of course, not gonna go through this in detail, it's all contained in the report, but hopefully what you see here is that we've tried to provide a map for you so that you can say, in this case, for example, if we want to focus on this aspect of good practice, which is about policies and strategic plans being aligned to the mission, goals, and principles of the institution, then what we need to do is look at these two tools, the Nadios's revised quality criteria and COL and DEMP's quality assurance toolkit. Those are the places where we will find uh, benchmarking tools that will help us with that work. Uh, and so, so we go down to quite a granular level to enable you to decide where and when to use these tools for your own purposes. Having done all of that, what we've then tried to do um, from many pages of documentation of uh, the case studies from the open universities that were assembled by SOU and IITE is we've tried to distill those good practices associated with quality assurance and benchmarking that we found to be common in some of the case studies. Um, I'm going to just go through these again very quickly uh, because all the documentation and information is contained in the main report. But this is just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that we've, we distilled from the case studies. And you can see in brackets there from which institutional case studies we derived these good practices. So these are all the way from very basic things like there's a clear statement about quality in the institution's mission statement. Then establishment of an independent unit to oversee quality assurance is something important uh, that is often done. Establishing defined quality standards for the institution uh, for quality assurance is another good practice. Affiliation to international organizations concerned with quality assurance in higher and open education is another example. Uh, I've got a few slides of these and I'm not going to read them all out, but I hope what you see from this, these examples is that we've tried to, just, in addition to the actual benchmarking tools, we've tried to use the case studies, the information that many of you supplied to IRTE and SOU as part of this collaborative process. We've distilled from those, those good practices that we think you might be interested in. And again, the idea is not to try to tell institutions what they should do, but it provides you a menu of options of things you might consider. So an institution could work through this list very quickly and assess which of these you already have in place and therefore you don't need to think about, which of them you have in place and you're not interested in, in which case you can ignore them, 
And then which of them you don't have in place, but you think might be good to implement in your institution. And then what you can do is delve into more detail in the institutional case study to see how this is being done in the open universities that are manifesting this good practice. And if you, if you think it's worthwhile, then you could follow up with them to get more information and more detail on how they're going about doing this. So for example, if you were thinking of establishing an open, a, an independent unit to oversee quality assurance, it would be very useful, I think, to go into more detail with these institutions to find out the structure of those quality assurance units, what the reporting lines are, how they go about their work, what level of detail they go into at the program and course level, how they interact with the faculties that might exist within the institution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the idea here is not for us to go into all that detail for each of these good practices, but rather to give you the roadmap so that you can pursue the ones that interest you the most uh, in more detail and help and use that to help you to build your own good practices. So here are some more examples, doing research in digital technologies and learning, quality assurance of educational materials. At, at the superficial level at which I'm presenting these good practices, of course, they may sound obvious, so what's hopefully of interest in the report and then in the more detailed case studies is not to hear that quality assurance of educational materials is being done, which we would like to hope is, is always the case, but rather to delve into the detail of how it's being done uh, in the universities that have shared this good practice. So there's more examples here. Uh, I highlight, for example, the example of social innovation and collaborative aspects of open learning being explicit in the institution strategy which I think is a relatively recent development and therefore something that might be uh, triggering interest in people and worthy of further exploration. And then also, for example, things like having a regionally or globally relevant or outward looking mandate. Uh, for me, this is in, something that's becoming increasingly important. Uh, we're seeing that the world is an increasingly uh, global village and that the kinds of problems we're grappling with as human societies are increasingly global in nature. Uh, and so I think retaining just a very narrow national focus in, what, in an institution's mandate of this kind is possibly not sufficient anymore. And that becomes particularly the case when many open universities are now delivering their courses and programs across national borders. So we may need to think on a more regional or even a more global basis uh, as we do that work. And as we think what quality means when we move beyond the national level. And then these are two last examples, um, which are sort of specific to students, which is about facilitating the connection to their communities, which I think is a really interesting one. And then of course, something growing in importance is nurturing the entrepreneurial potential of students. These are all aspects of quality, uh, all things that we might want to be considering as we move forward. So having gone through those good practices and shared a, a snapshot of what's in the case studies, the report then ends with a few uh, specific recommendations. Uh, and I will just go through those very briefly here as I close up my presentation. So the first recommendation is to consider joining a consortium or collaborative network of other open universities in many respects, thanks to the collaboration between Shanghai Open University and the IITE and Commonwealth of Learning and others. That network is already developing here through this series of webinars. And, and I think it's very clear, and that's obviously the underlying ethos of benchmarking, is that shared experience, data, and expertise can enable all members to identify the most useful determinants of quality, which can be adapted to specific contexts. So this is a really useful way of building quality and of being able to do ongoing benchmarking. Benchmarking, obviously, is strengthened by a range of examples and input of good practices. We very much hope that this draft report is contributing to that. But then next, we also make to have to make sure that within the institution, we adopt rigorous ongoing systems for collecting learning data and have processes for analyzing the data in relation to indicators of quali for quality. Now, many of your institutions already have this, but one of the things I'm struck by as I travel around the world, and I'm fortunate to travel to many different parts of the world in the work that I do, is to see how much lip service is paid to this, but actually the substantive practice is not yet being implemented. So people talk about evidence-based decision-making and data-driven decision-making all the time, 
In practice, the reality is that it is much less often done than it ought to be. And it is very seldom systematic in the way it should be. So I think this is a really important recommendation to consider. Again, the benchmarking tools can help us with identifying metrics we ought to be tracking in our uh, data analytics processes and helping us to think about how we can integrate that into effective strategic planning and decision making. And then uh, the next recommendation is to make very sure that we clarify the purpose and goals of our benchmarking. And I think I can't overstate the importance of this. I've provided you a whistle-stop tour through a lot of information, a lot of good practices, a lot of different tools. I think that can quite quickly get overwhelming. And if our benchmarking practices try to achieve too many goals at the same time, in my experience is the likelihood is that they will achieve none of them. So in my experience, having a very clear focus on specific goals and then driving the benchmarking processes as part of quality assurance to achieve those goals will deliver much stronger results than a, a holistic process that tries to do everything at the same time. So I think getting purpose and goals clearly defined up front will be very important to using the information that I've shared with you today successfully. Obviously, from there, we would identify domains or areas for benchmarking performance that would be based on those goals. And then, as I've discussed already, rather than just um, engaging with the benchmarking tools themselves, we could also consult case studies of open universities, such as the ones that have been assembled in this process, that exemplify those good practices and, and hopefully again the resource that we've prepared would help you with that. And then lastly of course we'd select an appropriate and relevant benchmarking tools from the map that we presented in section three and then use them in a contextually relevant way. Of course the reality is that this report can only cover uh, some benchmarking tools. We've tried to identify those that we believe are best uh, and most relevant to the kind of institutions that are part of this process. But you may have other tools that you know of uh, or, or that you feel are more relevant to your institution. Of course, you should integrate those into your processes as you see fit as well. So that is the uh, scope of the, 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 the report that, that we've prepared. Uh, which is, as I said, a draft. We're very much looking forward to the conversation that will flow from this, but I'll also obviously be very happy to take any questions for clarification, and we'd love to listen to comments that people have on what I've presented so far uh, so that we can continue to refine and improve the report that we've shared with you before it's finalized um, for wider circulation. So thank you very much for your attention, everyone. And I have, um, I, I hope it's been a useful overview of what we've done so far. Thank you very much, Neil, for your presentation. And our thanks goes to both of you, uh, Neil and Alison, for your work on this uh, report. So, uh, well, before I open the floor for the discussion, uh, well, I would like to um, invite the participants to raise their hands and ask questions, if any, to the presentation. Um, so, I don't see any hands. Well, I, so I, 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 was I have a couple of. Uh, sorry, go go ahead. Sorry, I was trying to raise my hand, and maybe I wasn't pressing the right place. Shall I go ahead? Yes, please. All right. No, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to thank Neil for this uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, the work is quite extensive, and uh, I think there's a lot you know that we can uh, learn from that. Uh, I want to call attention to a statement I think he made at the beginning, where he said that if ODL is not guided by good underlying educational principles, then the technology will probably only enhance uh, what you know uh, has been availed, as it were, uh, and of course vice versa. And I think uh, that is a very good starting point. Uh, you know, for all the discussions that we're having, uh, which is to say that uh, those underlying principles are very important. Uh, and that's why, you know, when he went on to talk about the Nadius uh, quality framework, uh, which I think uh, preceded even some of the e-learning things that we're talking about, 
Uh, every time you go back to that framework, you find that uh, that quite a lot of work, uh, you know, was done. And uh, many of the issues raised there are still as current as uh, you know you could say. I mean, maybe you only need to just uh, do some adaptation here and there. So there's quite a lot uh, in that regard. Uh, the other part that I'm also very happy with uh, is the one. I mean, in the document, I think it's page thirty. It should be page thirty-three. Uh, the issues of uh, the map of domains of quality indicators and areas of good practice for Open University with suggested openly available benchmarking tools. Uh, so, I mean, those domains, because at the point I was wondering, okay, what do we now focus on in terms of uh, uh, the various things that have been shared? How do we like, you know, put them together so that we have uh, a full idea of what, you know, we probably should be looking for in terms of the diversity and I guess that uh, you know really goes a long way. The ones that deal with uh, governance, policy, and strategic planning, quality assurance, uh, curriculum program, materials design, course delivery, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I thought I should just make that preliminary comment as a starting point of our discussion. Thank you very much. Um, th there was just a request, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself as well so that other colleagues can know who you are and where you come from. Oh, okay, I'm very we sorry. Do the, do the yeah. same for uh, us as we, as we talk. Thank uh, you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. My name is uh, uh I'm the Dean of the School of Education at the Botswana Open University. Uh, in my earlier years, I used to work uh, at the University of Botswana at the Center for Continuing Education of the University of Botswana, but uh, I'm here now at the Botswana Open University. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And um, we have also had a couple of questions in the, so, so uh, th th those were just comments. Uh, so so I, I won't respond to them directly other than to say, I'm, I'm grateful that you you found the document useful and, and some of the comments, I, I can't overstate the, the importance of having strong educational principles under, underpinning everything that gets done. Uh, people seem to forget that quite often. Maybe it's just a sign that I'm getting old, that I think that it's uh, increasingly important to remember the things that are well-tested good practices. Uh, but then we have a couple of questions also from Dorothy Gordon in the chat. Um, and, and so uh, Dorothy asks about purpose and goals. She says, it's very important. We need to clarify a bit more on, uh, on cost and benefit. So does implementation improve student completion rates? And I think I don't have obviously a universal answer to this question because as you can hear, I don't think there are universal answers to questions. I think a lot of it depends on where an institution is at in its own development process uh, and what it's trying to achieve. Um, but I do think that this is a critical question to be asking in, in, at all points in the process. Uh, I do find myself that there comes a, a, a critical tipping point uh, in quality assurance processes where the cost of implementation is actually no longer delivering a return on the investment. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, one of the, the risks of having central quality assurance units within an institution is that very often they start to exist for their own sake uh, and they start to think that their quality assurance processes are a sufficient reason for their existence rather than continually reflecting on what is the actual benefit to students and, and exactly how is the work of quality assurance improving student completion rates, the quality of the student experience and so on. Uh, and I think quite often what ends up happening is quality assurance processes get reduced to compliance based checklists of information uh, and, and academic staff and faculty have to spend an inordinate amount of time on what I would call academic administration. And I think that's the tipping point at which quality assurance has actually stopped being helpful. So I think reflecting on this question of what is the, the return on investment that we're getting from what we're doing uh, is absolutely critical. Simply repeating the same processes year on year is not going to be helpful, which is why I think that that recommendation of being very clear about purpose. And I think having the flexibility to change the purpose from year to year you know, once we strengthen in a particular area, we maybe don't need to keep investigating at the same level of depth. We move to new lenses through which we look at the issues of quality. 
She then raises a second question, which is about the idea of the percentage of revenue that should be invested here. She does go on to say that she recognizes that this is problematic, but that some managers do think in these terms. Um, unfortunately, I find it very difficult to answer that question in any meaningful way without getting myself into more trouble than, uh, so I, I think I'll sound like a politician here and say that I think it depends on the context, of course. Um, but I, because I think the problem is that it depends on how you're calculating the, in, the, the, the cost. So, so, so in my opinion, the focus should be on trying to ensure that these processes of benchmarking and quality assurance are not are as as much as possible embedded into the operations of the the institution and not actually separate standalone processes uh, because it's you know if for example the process of quality assurance and benchmarking is an integral part of all course design and all program development we can't then separate it separate it out as a discrete cost um, the discrete cost then comes from maybe a unit that's helping to embed those practices into the operations of the institution. I would argue that, relatively speaking, a, a relatively small percentage of total revenue would need to be spent on that. But that does depend on the extent to which we're successful in creating those kinds of learning systems. So in, in my head, the percentage that I'm thinking of would be somewhere between, say, half to 1% of inst total institutional revenue being spent on those central processes. But I think that that would depend very heavily on the extent to which we are meaningfully decentralizing the roles and responsibilities of quality assurance and benchmarking to the places where they logically belong, instead of keeping them within a central unit that is doing all of the quality assurance and benchmarking on behalf of the institution. I recognize that what I'm saying may be quite controversial, uh, there's a lot of people who argue strongly and, and uh, very uh, forcefully and, and, and persuasively about the importance of big central units of quality assurance. But having been around the block a few times, my experience is that those sooner rather than later become their own bureaucracy. Uh, and I think they get in the way of the kind of flexibility that is needed for effective quality assurance. Um, so I'm personally in favor of decentralizing the functions and keeping the central investment costs relatively lightweight. I ex explain, these are not opinions in the report. These are just Neil Butcher's personal opinions. So please treat them with the uh, with all caution um, supplied regarding their validity. Mm, any more questions? Mm, well, if uh, well, no questions from the participants. Uh, well, now I would like to start the discussion and probably I'll try to trigger um, the discussion by posing a question. Uh, well, as you could see, the authors of the report and the project team uh, share uh, the common opinion that, uh, well, there is no need for a universal one it's all uh, benchmarking tool uh, instead uh, well from the spectrum the palette of available uh, benchmarking tools uh, uh, each university should uh, uh, select uh, those that fit their mission priorities etc so we would appreciate uh, the feedback from the participants on this issue Yes, please. We can't hear you. Yes, please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Neil and um, the team that um, is taking this project for the results and this presentation. For me, I think it's important um, for us to work together because um, globally we are talking of mobility. You are talking of um, 
um, credit transfer. So if you're talking of credit transfer, we must have um, tools by which we measure our performance. So benchmarking is good, but that should not be a rule to um, operate individual institutions. Indiv individual institutions should have their own bespoke um, tools that they use, but they also should compare it with the global best practice. So for Opal universities, I think it's um, it has come of age for us to have something like this. A network is good, comparison of our um, practices is good, but that should not mean that um, you must operate with just the global overview. You must have your own peculiarities. For instance, for us in Nigeria, the culture is important. So when we develop our processes, our policies, we have to integrate our culture into it. But if we have a global um, toolkit, for instance, it may not consider our own culture, um, which can never be universal. Individuals must have their own culture and their own differences. But I think this direction is good to have a document to help us um, globally, but individuals should also have their own. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, well, you did not introduce yourself. So you are from Nigeria, from which institute? All right. I am Moni Oluwa Olaniyi from the National Open University of Nigeria. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your feedback. Anybody else? We still have about 20 minutes to exchange our opinions. Uh, well, but uh, well, otherwise uh, we would. Uh, but Lana, I see Pretty has her hand up. Mm, yeah. I cannot see it, but ah, uh -huh, now I see. Please go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pretty Gunvert from Mauritius. Actually, I'm not from the an open university. I'm the, from the main university of Mauritius, and uh, we were invited to attend this. I do not have the report, so I don't have any idea, but I wanted to have, because we, since uh, some time now, we have been engaged in a, a mixture of blended learning, especially since COVID. So we have had to jump into this uh, blended learning mode and etc. So we have been trying to fend for ourselves. So I, I thought that this talk would be very important for us because uh, we've started using all types of tools and uh, we have our quality assurance office in Mauritius at the University of Mauritius trying to do things. So it was very important for me, but I will ask our VC, for example, to get us the report so that because it looks, it's very interesting and I want to continue following the set of webinars that will, uh, the eight others that are coming. And uh, this, uh, the tools that uh, were introduced where you had so many aspects, I found this uh, analogy to a cake where it can be divided into nine or four or what, whatever pieces. So that would be an approach I would think of like, like we can start with four focus and then move to six, et cetera, but uh, changing the focus. We do have something at the University of Mauritius, but uh, it's always good to improve and learn from others. So I wanted just to make a comment. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we will share with you the draft so that you would be able to provide your feedback and further comments. And of course, the um, uh, well, the, the final version. Uh, the report is not uh, available for public access. We uh, distributed it uh, among the participants of the previous uh, webinar. Uh, that we hold last year and uh, uh, some other um, contributors of case studies from uh, open universities worldwide. 
Um, but uh, of course, we will share again uh, the uh, the draft report with all those who have registered uh, um, to this webinar, but uh, well, didn't receive the uh, the report itself. Any other comments, uh, feedback, maybe? I think there's a Dorothy Godin raising the hand. Mm -hmm. Well, for whatever reason, I don't see uh, the hand. So please go ahead, just switch on your mic and uh, okay. you're welcome. Thank you so much, Svetlana, and thank you for um, organizing the seminar. I think it's a lot of food for thought. Uh, I thought that uh, Madame Priti raised some interesting dimensions. Um, how much of what we are discussing in this report with respect to open universities and their use of technology um, is going to be of relevance to the more traditional universities that are moving now to a blended learning approach. And I'd really like it if uh, Neil could speak to that issue because we now have a, um, a very different situation with respect to open universities than we had uh, 20 years ago. Um, everybody's moving to blended. Are we all going to be open universities? So over to you, Neil. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Um, so as it as it happens, interestingly, I've just returned from Mozambique, where I've been working with an institute called UNICED, uh, which is a dedicated online university that has 31,000 students in Mozambique. Um, it's actually a private institution and, and quite interesting because it is very new. So it is specifically a distance online university as opposed to a, an open university that then has uh, taken on online learning practices. So the, the short answer to your question, although those of you who know me will know, unfortunately, short answers and me are largely mutually exclusive concepts, um, will, is that I think there are lots of ways at the micro level of course delivery where we can reflect on how blended learning practices and the assuring the quality of the teaching and learning activities taking place in a blended learning course can also translate helpfully into uh, open, so distance education, online learning, uh, so open and distance learning. However, for me, and, and maybe this reflects my more traditional roots uh, in distance education, I think this, the fundamental difference is the difference of scale. Um, dedicated open and distance learning institutions are typically uh, requiring the investments in high quality independent study environments that are not required in blended learning. And so there are lots of ways in which the educational design process in a blended learning course that is a comp and, and of course we know that the distance education can include judicious use of face to face uh, activities tutorials and so on. But the core feature of good quality distance education is investing heavily in the quality of the teaching and learning environment, the course materials. And obviously in online learning, that's the use of the technologies and, and, and so on and so forth to support effective independent study. My experience is and remains that there are no shortcuts to doing that. You can get away with a lot of shortcuts in blended learning. If you try and import those shortcuts into a proper open and distance learning course or program, you are going to have significant, they're going to be negative consequences in terms of learner dropout or in terms of the quality of the learning experience being delivered. And, and that can very often high graduation rates can actually be an example of bad quality because uh, if it's too easy for people to pass courses and programs, which has been the case in many open universities I've looked at, that's not good quality. That just means lots of people are passing. But if the courses and programs are not helping them with success after they've graduated, then it's of limited value. So I, I would say that, that one, should engage with those instruments around blended learning and see what there is to, to distill from them. Um, but I would be very careful to always look through the lens 
uh, of what it takes to deliver high quality independent study experiences at scale, which for me is a core feature of an open university. Uh, and unfortunately, lots of universities of open universities have strayed away from that. And I don't think that that's actually to the benefit of students. The converse, I don't think is true. In other words, I think the people involved in the design of blended university learning experiences for uh, traditional face to face institutions, for example, when there's that diversification of teaching and learning methods have a lot to learn from distance education. I reflect maybe my own career bias here, but I think that there is a certain rigor about educational design processes in well designed distance education and open learning programs that is often missing in face to face courses and programs. So particularly if we have a traditional face to face university, they will often tend to have a very heavily lecture based mode of delivery. And when they're then creating blended learning, very often the pedagogy of lecturing transfers into the blended learning. So we're actually using the technology to deliver lectures in a fairly similar way to the way in which we did in a face to face university. In my opinion, that's a very bad use of technology. And so I think those face to face institutions that are interested in expanding into blended learning or already busy doing it can learn a lot by reflecting on uh, good practices in distance education and online. You know, when, so when I say online learning, I mean online learning for open universities, for ODL purposes, because there's so many different kinds of online learning. Um, and, and the rigor of designing high quality learning experiences for large scale implementation carries a lot of lessons with it that I think blended learning program designers can uh, learn from very fruitfully. So, sorry, I give opinionated answers in, in these Q&A sessions to stimulate thinking. Um, I'll steadfastly deny anything I say five minutes from now, but I hope that that's been a useful response to your question, Dorothy. Yeah, I think it was an excellent re response. And in fact, it warrants a whole uh, paper on this issue because it's a very central issue to so many of us now looking at higher education. And I was having an aside is Moniolua um, about what kind of cultural practices she was referring to. And she was just explaining how different, how differently you approach women who you want to get into your institution and men in her context. So maybe she wants to comment on that. Sorry, Svetlana. <laughs> no problem. So are you ready? Yeah, maybe, you know, um, for us, um, our culture differs from location to location. So um, in different parts of the country, because we cannot um, divorce education from a number of things, including um, religion and culture. And um, we have some parts of the country where the um, females are restricted and the uh, movement is not as um, free as you have with um, some other parts of the country. So in this case, as an institution to develop our policy, our processes, we must consider these different regional um, variations. Uh, so if we have, um, a process, for instance, we cannot say that you have to just do it this way. Sometimes we say, if you are in this region, then you can handle it this way. Even though we have our guidelines, you still have to um, review such a guideline based on the part of the country that you are operating from. And it's still the same institution. Um, we discover that from our data, more women are actually um, graduating from our programs than men, though it may not be statistically um, different because it's like 52% females to like 48% males. But it's interesting to us that we have more success with females. And um, it means then that females because of the culture for instance if you cannot be very active then you are focused on doing something and like Neil said that 
for our benchmarking, let's be specific with goals. So a female student is specific and just wants to get this education done and have a proof of it. So they always push through. But probably a male, because you have many things that are contending for your attention. If you are um, a family person, you have to attend to your family. You have to provide, you have to do a number of things. So you have your job to also do. And this may contain the time that you devote to your um, academics. And then when such groups of people demand for more time, you cannot say no. Even if your guideline says you should do it this way. Otherwise, then we lose um, their interest. So in everything we do, it's a complex system, but a number of times we have to factor in this culture. Um, if you are from a region where access is restricted, then now we have made provision sometimes if a student prefers to do exam virtually, proctored exam, then you can opt for it. So in that case, if you are from a region that restricts movement and um, you are not allowed to move out, then you can take your exam and still be proctored from a distance. And then if you cannot go to your study center because of um, your job, your job demand, you are in the military and then you have just suddenly been reposted, then we review our policy to accommodate such. For us, um, that policy, we have to operate with it, even though sometimes we change them within a short period. If somebody is checking our documents from outside, you tend to think that we don't have a culture of um, trajectory of sustenance of our uh, policies, but that is not the case. It's because we have to operate within our culture and to ensure that we accommodate um, all these needs. Um, so if we are using um, documents that is a global standard, we can operate with, within that sphere for a certain percentage of our delivery. But at a certain level, we also must consider what we have within us so that we don't send our um, students away. I hope I've been able to explain that. So for us, religion, we play a lot of roles. Uh, religion, religion affects our culture. And so these also um, we consider in putting our policies together and operating them. Thank you. Thank you, Raul, for raising this uh, important and sensitive issue. And well, indeed it should be paid attention. Uh, thank you. And Neil, there is uh, one more question in chat. Have you noticed? Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, the question asks, just for those who haven't seen it or notes that, that students often join ODL universities only when they can't get into the traditional face-to-face -face university. Uh, the report asks if, if we take this into consideration. The overt answer or direct answer is no, we don't. Um, but I think the implicit answer is actually yes, we do, because there are various reasons why uh, students tend to uh, perceive face-to-face -face universities as being higher quality and, and try to get into them first. Uh, a lot of that is misperception um, be because uh, people are, tend to be comfortable with what they know. Very often there's also parental and, and, and family pressure associated with that. Parents like their, their, their children or, uh, to do the same kind of education they did, even if the evidence is not strong, that the quality is good. But another significant part of the reason why there is that preference is because very often ODL universities are not delivering high quality educational experiences. And you have to excuse me for being blunt in saying this. Of course, I, I excuse everybody here. We, we know that this is not the case here, but there, I've been in this field for a long time. And, and there are many open universities where unfortunately the quality of the education historically 
has not been um, as good as you would find in a top class face-to-face -face university. So I think implicitly the way in which we're addressing that in this report is to focus on what the open universities can control. It's very difficult to control the perceptions of society, but I think what we can control is investing in the quality of what we're doing and building a strong and steady reputation. Uh, and in, in countries in the world where institutions have done that, we have seen that over time, the, the, this preconception, this bias against open universities starts to decline. Um, and, and what that can should also be associated with, hopefully, is persuading governments that they should invest properly in open universities. One of the key reasons why open universities struggle often with quality is because their, their funding is prejudiced also against them. The expectation by governments is for them to deliver large volume, mediocre quality educational programs. So as we invest in quality processes of the kind that I've tried to describe today, we build that reputation, we build that quality, and we also build the case for, for higher levels of investment by gov government and the private sector in what we're doing to uh, create parity of quality. My personal view is that good quality distance education and online learning should actually not only be able to compete uh, at the same level with face-to-face -face education, but should be able to outcompete it because courses and programs that are based on very strong investment in high quality edu educational design should all other things being equal deliver a much better quality educational experience than is possible with very low numbers of students. Um, so, so sorry, there's a, a second question there and, and then I'll open to you as well, Alison, is about the entry level of students when they do not meet the requirements. Um, so, so obviously th this is a function of, of Again, the purpose of the institution, uh, why, why does it exist? So some open universities explicitly exist to, gi to give access to students who do not meet the entry requirements for face-to-face -face universities. Again, there's lots of evidence over the years that actually institutions that's, that have uh, lower entry level requirements, open universities, than their face-to-face -face counterparts, because obviously the face-to-face -face counterparts can have high entry level requirements often because the, the competition for places is very stiff. But again, if we have a very well-designed course, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to bring in people who, who have lower levels of entry requirements and still build them up to be highly successful and to gain reputation that way. I, I think it's, it's massively misrepresentative to assume that just because students have been failed by their prior educational experience and therefore their entry level uh, qualifications are lower, that we can't help them to catch up that learning deficit. Well-designed distance education programs can help students to recover a backlog of education that they may not have received in their school career and help them to catch up and then to exceed their peers. And we should have those aspirations in mind with open universities. We should not see open universities as an alternative for those who can't get into the face-to-face -face system. We should see open universities as institutions that are delivering a very critical restorative social justice function in delivering high quality learning experiences to people who are otherwise denied that opportunity. And the examples were given of women earlier, uh, excellent examples of how we can use open learning in the, open, open, open universities in that way. And, and we should then make sure that our commitment is to ensuring that the, the graduates coming out of those programs are at the same level, at least, if not at a higher level than those coming out of face-to-face -face counterparts. And that's how we'll overcome uh, the, the inbuilt bias in society. Sorry, Alison, I went on too long. So over to you quickly. Thanks, Neil. I just wanted to add something to that, which um, builds on what Neil has said and addresses these last two questions. And that is that although the report doesn't explicitly deal with this issue, if you go and look at the case studies, um, one, some of the, the strengths that really come through there, that there are universities like Athabasca, for example, that um, has a whole uh, sort of emphasis on Indigenous knowledge, First Nations people. Um, there's lots of other examples as well in the case studies of open universities that are um, doing an excellent job actually of supporting their learners um, and are actually preferred for those reasons. So, you know, there's, there's this, and I, I think this also um, builds on what uh, Prof Olenia said, 
is that in, in you know, when an open university adopts an inclusive approach to delivering education and is really very learner centered, um, that is actually a huge strength and it comes through in um, a lot of the case studies. So if you, um, if, you're, if you get a copy of that report and you have a look specifically at the section of the summaries of the case studies, um, you'll see several examples of that where um, it's, it, it's certainly not that, you know, students are seeing it as a last resort, but actually it's a preference um, because there is something that open universities are doing that perhaps is not available to those learners um, in traditional universities. So I think that the, the report touches on it in the sense that it presents those case studies or summaries of the case studies where um, the, this issue is addressed and what it shows actually sort of emphasizes what the point that Neil has made is that open universities have this opportunity and some of them are in fact doing it really well already in terms of meeting needs of learners and it and outside of that perception that we're just doing this as a you know going through this process as a last resort so I just wanted to add that in terms of the report thank you thank you Neil and Alison and uh, uh, well I I'm afraid we are coming to an end and uh, closing the webinar. I would like to thank uh, all participants and I hope you will join me uh, in thanking uh, the speakers. And once again, our thanks go to uh, uh, all participants for their active involvement in the discussion. I can see in chat um, that, uh, well, there are requests for the draft report. Uh, uh, well, I, I didn't see in the Excel uh, sheet uh, with the registered participants their email addresses. Um, and I would like to ask my colleagues whether we have uh, all the email addresses of all participants so that we could uh, send uh, the report to uh, others who haven't received it yet. Uh, you uh, yes, we do. We, we do have them. So we will be uh, able to share the report after the meeting. Okay, so thanks again to all of you and well, uh, uh, whenever you have any further comments or feedback, you are most welcome to send them to us. Thank you and see you at the next webinar. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope we can receive the recording of this meeting. Thank you. Uh, yes, we will send you a link. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay.